Um, Emeritus Professor Gillian Triggs currently directs most of her considerable energy towards Justice Connect, where she is chair. This non-for-profit organisation is dedicated to connecting people locked out of the justice system with free legal help. Gillian has an imposing background in law and tertiary education, yet also has continued with an international commercial legal practice. She has advised the Australian and other governments and international organisations on international legal and trade disputes. And if that's not enough, she was also president of the Australian Human Rights Commission from 2012 to 2017. Her presentation today is titled Human Rights in a Post-Truth World. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Gillian Truth. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. I don't actually remember buying a face mask, but I'm sure I need one. <laughs> um, it's a huge pleasure to be here as part of the Durham Durham Festival um, and see so many different people here and, uh, and uh, particularly to see that it's a student organised uh, conference that's been enormously successful over a number of years. I've been picked up at the airport just a few minutes ago um, by a couple of students in the space of a 20 minute uh, uh, trip. We've solved a number of human rights law problems. Uh, we've agreed that there needs to be a proper balance on freedom of speech and to protect 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, we've agreed that we need a new tort of privacy and we've also agreed that we need a charter of human rights in Australia. So we've done a lot in 20 minutes and, uh, <laughs> and it was a great discussion, really absolutely fantastic and it was wonderful to come around into the entrance of the school and see that word truth as the first of your uh, mottos, truth, compassion, and wisdom. Thank you. Not sure about the last, not so good at that, but not so bad at trying to work out what truth is. And my, my topic today is human rights in a post-truth world. Um, and may I, before I begin, acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal peoples, and particularly respect any uh, indigenous Australians who are with us today. Well, this is an important subject, truth, um, and I'd have to say that I went to university in the early 60s when science and the facts were king. That's what we valued. Uh, we were on our way to the moon. Uh, science subjects at, uh, at university were uh, seen as the most intellectual, the most difficult, but the most important of the subjects that one could study. Maybe that was an imbalanced view at the time, but I wanted to give you some sense of how important it was that we had uh, factual evidence for the policies and positions that we took. Sadly, it seems that that really is under threat today, and that's why I'm so very happy to be speaking to uh, a younger audience of, uh, of uh, school students and university students, uh, because I think you're the ones that are going to have to carry this message of pushing back against the post-truth world that we seem to be living in. And just to pick a very recent example, you may all be aware of a, a member of the Kata Party just a few days ago, Fraser Anning, announcing that he had 1,000% support in Australia for an end to Muslim migration as the final solution. That really shocking statement has had an important impact in that both of our major party leaders, Mr Turnbull and Mr Shorten, have joined together to say that is not uh, government or opposition policy that is not a view that we support in Australia. But what interests me is this use of language to suggest, in this case, that he has 1,000% support for his point of view. Um, if you look, as a matter of fact, at the Scanlon uh, Foundation's report for last year, we find that 63% of Australians uh, greatly value immigration to this country, that 73% agree that any selection in our migration policy should never be based on racial, religious, or ethnic grounds. And there is overwhelming support for our relatively successful multicultural society. But my concern, and the thing that I'd like to talk to you about today, is in this post-truth environment, if facts don't matter anymore, what are the implications for the rule of law in our society, and how can human rights be protected. 
Well, it may seem rather presumptuous of me to talk about post-truth or the truth, as though I had some sort of corner on what is the truth. I certainly don't. But as a lawyer admitted um, 50 years ago, I've t taken for granted that law and policy will be informed by the facts and by objective truth. I've struggled with this cultural and political phenomenon of false news over the last five years as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. And I've learned that in the current political environment, facts and evidence are by no means uh, imperatives in informing uh, law reform or policy. Well, what do we mean by post-truth? We do, of course, love a pithy phrase, even a slogan that seems to provide a truth that we've not articulated before. The Oxford Dictionary, only a year or so ago, included the term post-truth as the word of the year. Well, perhaps the most notorious example was made by Kelly Ann Conway a couple of, well, just over a year ago, with regard to the allegation by the White House Press Secretary, Sean Spicer, that the inauguration of President Trump was the largest ever inauguration in the entire history of the United States, or indeed of the universe. <laughs> the statement was factually and objectively untrue. But Kellyanne Conway said to the media, well, you're saying it's a falsehood, but all Sean Spicer did was give you an alternative fact. Well, there's no such thing as an alternative fact. There may be other facts which moderate your view, cause you to rethink. That's, of course, what good uh, analysis and thinking is all about. But there's no such thing as an alternative fact, unless you're one of these wonderful physicists who sits on, a, on another planet and observes the universe. Uh, things can be, for most of us, fairly grounded and fairly objective. The idea that there are alternative facts and that they have credibility has created an Alice in Wonderland world, where as Humpty Dumpty, where Humpty Dumpty said, when I use a word, it means what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question, said Alice, is whether you can make words mean so many different things. But perhaps with a more sinister twist, George Orwell put it in 1984, where the party oligarch reminded our hero, reality exists in the human mind and nowhere else. Whatever the party holds to be truth is truth. Well, we can't possibly discuss post-truth without reference to Mr. Trump. And a fact check website has reported that last year, President Trump made 4,229 false or misleading claims over 558 days <laughs> at, at a rate of 7.6 claims a day. <laughs> well, that's pretty, that's pretty shocking. Um, and there are many other examples, but I will say that I come to you today in a state of complete certainty because the sort of things that I want to talk to you about today were fact-checked uh, three or four days ago by the ABC and by the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. So this is the first speech I'm able to give in which I can be certain that I've got it right. <laughs> we need more fact-checking so that we are not out there. And they fact-checked a media um, a speech that I gave. You know, you get a 30-minute uh, grab with the, with the ABC News, but they want to be sure what I'm saying is right. They checked it against reasonably good sources, and they concluded that I was both fair and accurate, so I'm delighted by that. Um, but let me give you some other examples, because they've been very, very important ones. <coughs> the false premises made during the Brexit campaign, uh, particularly that the cost of EU membership at 350 million a week would go, if Brexit was successful, to the National Health Service. Firstly, the figure was wrong, but even Brexit supporters admitted that the statement was completely false, but that the election, from their point of view, would not have been won without that misinformation. But closer to home, and one that's been very important to me as President of the Human Rights Commission, is the children overboard misstatement in 2001. And some of you in this audience will remember uh, that asylum seekers seeking Australia's protection uh, were accused by, uh, by Mr Howard of the coalition of throwing their children overboard so that they would be rescued and brought within Australia's jurisdiction and able to make a claim for refugee status. Um, and pictures, photographs were used to support this. A few weeks later, very few weeks later, uh, a new election was held and Mr Howard won. Uh, in a context in which it's believed that this misstatement tipped the election in his favour. Now, 
The point that I want to make is that some months later, the Senate conducted its own inquiry into the children of abortive statement and found that it was, there was not a scintilla of evidence for the truth, that the photographs used allegedly to support the statement were from a totally different environment in which a boat had overturned and children and their parents were swimming in the water. Um, the, the point is, and that, that is what's so critical for us to understand, is that the misstatement or the slogan based on falsity can be of enormous political importance at a particular point in time. The fact that you have an inquiry some months later that says that this was entirely false becomes in the end yesterday's news and has very little impact. And in fact, I think people remember the children overboard statement, they don't remember the Senate view that there was not a scintilla of evidence to support it. Um, another that I think was particularly um, spiteful and wrong was the allegation that the remarkable people from Save the Children who were working on Nauru uh, had encouraged those children to self-harm and commit suicide. Um, that again, in a later inquiry, was found to be entirely false and every member of the Save the Children who'd been working so hard for those children uh, was exonerated. But the damage is done. You smear and affect important institutions within our democracy and I think that's very damaging. But it's a paradox, of course, that compared to my day, and I mentioned my time at university in the 60s, compared to my time when information was difficult to obtain and you had to go to the library, in fact, to find anything out, um, these days you have almost instant information through uh, social media. We have more information crowding us than we've ever had in the history of mankind. And yet, oddly, our judgments are increasingly emotional and ideological. They are binary, it's either one or the other, they're highly personal, um, and we tend to read, not newspapers that might give us a variety of views, but we tend to walk in a hall of mirrors. We go to the social media sites that reflect back the views that we already have. And I think that this is extremely dangerous if we want to try to get to the truth. Um, and we find, and I have certainly found in my position as President of the Human Rights Commission, that research, scientific evidence, and balanced data-based reports are often ignored in favor of these entrenched personal views. The national debate on climate change and energy policy is an example of this, along with policies on education, homelessness, youth suicide, and indigenous deten uh, detention. There's nothing, of course, new about the idea of government propaganda that distorts the truth for political purposes. And it's well recognized that the first casualty of war is the truth. But post-truth politics is not quite the same as lies or spin or falsehood. The essence is not the mendacity, but the community's response to it, the willingness of the public to accept the spin and the falsity. That is what worries me. Uh, one wonders why. Is it the overload of information? Is it the failure of our journalists to ever look at primary sources? They spin secondary sources. Uh, is it that we distrust democratic institutions? Uh, is it that our parliamentary processes are breaking down, that parliamentary committees break down along party lines and ideological lines? Um, there isn't even now a call for the Human Rights Committee in Parliament to be disbanded, and of course for the Human Rights Commission itself to be disbanded. Whatever the causes, my concern is that a culture of post-truth has enabled governments and parliaments to reject evidence-based reports by credible bodies in civil society and government in favour of decision-making that responds to fear, especially of terrorism and conflict, and the mass movement of peoples seeking our protection. Well, let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean and, and why I believe this is so destructive. And one. Um, area of work that we spent quite a bit of time on at the Human Rights Commission concerned the extraordinary uh, statistic of the incarceration of Indigenous Australians throughout Australia, but most particularly in the Northern Territory. And I gave a speech a couple of years ago in which I said that 96% of juveniles in, uh, in the Northern Territory were Indigenous. And there was that horrible response from back of the audience that every speaker dreads because a hand shot up and he said, you're wrong. And of course I froze and he said, 99% are indigenous. And it's subsequently been confirmed that there's not a single Anglo-Australian non-indigenous person, juvenile, in detention in the Northern Territory. They are all indigenous youths. 
the figure across Australia as a whole is 55%. Well, some uh, years ago, two, three years ago, I had reported to Parliament on a particularly egregious matter. It's a case that came to the Commission uh, as a complaint, and it was by the legal advisor, a legal advocate, for a young boy who'd had an absolutely tragic life. And when I reread my own report, tears come to my eyes. This was a young boy, indigenous. His mother was unable to care for him. He was moved from pillar to post. He probably had a fetal alcohol uh, syndrome, uh, intellectual disability. Uh, and he was in despair. The authorities found a place for him to go to where he would get proper medical care. And his uncle agreed to drive him to that place uh, one, one day. The young boy, aged um, 15 to 16, packed his backpack, his, his games, his uh, clothes, some water, and he waited, and he waited, and, his, and he waited. The uncle turned up later that night drunk, a fight ensued, and the 16-year-old picked up a knife from the kitchen and killed his uncle. He was brought into juvenile detention, a horrible uh, a, a conflict, a terrible death, a tragedy. Uh, he, uh, of course, would be guilty of manslaughter were he an adult, but he was held in, in, in the facility, and in that period during his teenage years, he's now an adult, still in detention, but during those years when he was 16 or 17, he was held in a steel restraint chair and in um, isolation in his cell for 16 hours a day. If he was ever let out, he was always manacled. Um, and that treatment is in breach of the basic provisions of the Torture Convention. Well, I, uh, um, through the Commission staff, investigated that case, uh, and we made the recommendation to the government that to hold these juveniles in these conditions um, was cruel treatment, contrary to the um, Torture Convention, but it was also contrary to the basic provisions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to say nothing, of course, of other human rights conventions. Well, that report was tabled in Parliament with the words from the attorney, I table this report. There was nothing to indicate the content of the report, and I don't believe it was ever read, and certainly not read by anybody who was influential. And it sank like a stone. But then one evening, we all watched that Four Corners report uh, and saw the shocking CCTV footage of the treatment of those young boys, and we saw that and got that iconic photograph of another young man, not the one I'd reported on, uh, in the steel restraint with the hood over his head in uh, horrible conditions in Dondell Detention Centre. That hit the, the TV program that evening, and the following morning, very early in the morning I might add, if you'll excuse me, name dropping, the Prime Minister was on the phone and said, what should we do, should we hold a Royal Commission? Of course I agreed, and I'm sure he talked to many, many other people who gave him the same advice. But the point is that that tipping event, that iconic photograph, was what made the difference. That um, a view from the Australian Human Rights Commission, I believe factually and legally accurate, is ignored. What made the difference was the iconic photograph. For my age group, my, my generation in the 60s, early 70s, the iconic photograph was of a nine-year-old girl running down the streets of Hanoi to avoid the napalm bombing. That was a tipping point. Um, some might remember the photograph, I think, four years ago of a little boy, Alain, uh, drowned on a beach in Turkey. Um, in the world we live in, you need these tipping points. Uh, I can't rage against that, but what I do say is what a great shame it is that I and many, many others report on these kinds of human rights abuses, but are basically ignored. Um, the other one, of course, that, uh, that was very dear to my heart was the Forgotten Children's Report uh, that the Human Rights Commission uh, uh, produced. Um, we uh, conducted this inquiry into 1,100 children who had been detained uh, un for unprecedented periods of time in immigration detention on Christmas Island, uh, in, on Australian uh, detention facilities, uh, in Tasmania, uh, South Australia, Western Australia, uh, uh, outside uh, Queensland, or, uh, Brisbane, uh, Villawood in, in, in uh, Sydney, and, uh, and, at, uh, and in Darwin, along with, of course, Nauru. Um, those children have been held for a very long period, and we made an investigation into their, their mental and physical state. It was a qualitative and quantitative piece of research. Uh, we took the medical profession with us, um, and one of them, a leading um, paediatrician from uh, Sydney, 
said with me on, a, on one of my many trips to Christmas Island where there was no school at all for these children, every child on the island was sick. I couldn't possibly have made that judgment, but she could. She was, she was experienced enough to know the state, the mental state in particular of these children. And we found that across the detention centers at that time, 34% um, of the children had moderate to severe mental illness as a direct consequence of their uh, detention in the uh, deta uh, lengthy detention in the detention center facilities. Um, now, you will all know that we held five public hearings. We had unprecedented numbers at that time of, um, of public uh, submissions to talk about the conditions of the children. And of course, we found very severe breaches of human rights. Uh, that report was produced again to Parliament. Um, the leader of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee refused to read the report at all, and the government dismissed the report as politically biased. Now, Again, it's, I'm not here to talk about my concern about the reports of the Human Rights Commission not being um, read. Because many others made exactly the same points. The Children's Forgotten Inquiry report was repeated by the Moss Inquiry a few months later, by a Senate Inquiry, and by numerous United Nations bodies, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, the Rapporteur on the Convention Against Torture, and the Rapporteur on the provision that prohibits arbitrary detention without charge or trial. These are all uh, really impeccable sources in terms of the evidence, but they are and they continue to be ignored by the government, where we still have about 130 children uh, held uh, in one form or another on uh, Nauru. And those children have been there for more than four and a half years in, in many cases. Uh, it's a great tragedy, um, but it forms part of a much bigger pattern of uh, the chipping away at the human rights of Australians. Uh, usually, uh, coming from that year of the children overboard misstatement, and that is a conflation of a fear of terrorism, of a fear of invasion by asylum seekers and refugees, the people smugglers business model underpinning it, uh, the deaths at sea of, of uh, innocent people, uh, but in particular, a fear of international terrorism, remembering, of course, that the same year as the Children Overboard Statement uh, was later that year the attacks on uh, the Pentagon and the Twin Towers on 9-11. And I think that we've seen since that time a, a severe uh, in, uh, reduction in the kinds of freedoms that we have traditionally had in Australia, uh, whether we talk about the, the metadata retention laws, uh, the stripping of dual citizenship by the uh, Minister for Immigration, who now has outside wartime unprecedented powers uh, that are discretionary, and, and this is perhaps a lawyer's point, but it's an important one, those powers of the minister cannot be compelled by a court of law, and for practical purposes, they cannot be reviewed by a court of law. Uh, and these are, this sounds very ab abstract, and I've moved from uh, very particular examples to the abstract po problem of executive power and a failure to respect the separation of powers between the courts and, the, and parliament and the executive. These are abstract ideas, but because they're abstract, they're ones that don't really uh, move uh, hearts as well as minds. I think uh, perhaps in Canberra you're more aware than much of the rest of Australia um, of the extent to which um, these executive powers are being expanded, usually on the pretext, in my view, of a fear of, uh, of risks to border security and, uh, and so on. So we now have mounting laws on um, uh, restricting freedom of association laws, uh, freedom of protest, um, restrictions on our rights to privacy, uh, and on advocacy within civil society, very significantly impacted uh, it is probably the case under the new foreign interference and espionage laws. But you can see from the language, two pieces of law, uh, uh, two laws passed just uh, two or three weeks ago using this emotive language, foreign interference and espionage. How do you, as an ordinary member of the public, contest with that kind of language uh, when the impact is going to be on various civil society groups? receiving funds internationally for their advocacy, whether it's asylum seekers or political freedom. Um, these are a, a very significant concern to me. So 
pulling back from all of those examples and my concerns as now a former president of the Human Rights Commission, I am deeply concerned about the risks to fundamental freedoms in Australia and by uh, our inability to uh, protect against executive power. Now, some might say, well, we have our judges, we have our courts and we have the common law. But the very great difficulty is that the major treaties that protect our human rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Refugees Convention, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, are not directly part of Australian law. So that if I go to see the minister or all through my lawyers go to the federal or high court, the response will be, well, that's very interesting about the prohibition on arbitrary detention without charge or trial in the International Covenant, but it's not part of Australian law. If you look at our constitution, our constitution protects very few of our rights. Um, it's not the um, inspiring document that the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights will be. It's a very practical document about the division of powers among the federal and state governments. But we don't have a right to freedom of speech in our constitution. Our High Court has had to imply it. We don't have a right to vote across the country. The High Court has had to imply it. We do have a right to freedom of religious expression, although you would never believe that if you'd listened to the, uh, those that voted against uh, the right, or rather uh, it had a postal vote, against the right to equality of, of, uh, of marriage. Um, in fact, the right to freedom of religious expression is one of the very few rights in our constitution, along with the right to judicial review by the courts. But unfortunately, too often, legislation excludes the power of the courts and imposes, for example, mandatory sentencing provisions. That means that the courts uh, cannot uh, examine the matter. So where have I reached at the end of my period uh, um, with the Commission? Um, and that is to say that we now really need to revisit the need for a Charter of Rights in Australia. Uh, we have a Charter of Rights and Responsibilities in Victoria, and it's been relatively successful. It's not often before the courts. It's quite unusual, as a matter of fact. But what it does is inform all government decision making and provides a check and a balance against the abuse of executive power and the abuse of power by parliament, uh, in, in my view, a significant abuse of power. So I think we need to revisit the Charter. And you might recall that in uh, 2009, Father Frank Brennan ran a national inquiry um, and consultation to see whether or not a federal charter would be a good idea. And uh, Father Brennan and, the, and his panel uh, reported back to the government to the effect that yes, there was an overwhelming support throughout Australia for some form of federal check and balance that would uh, provide a legislative um, capacity for the courts to, uh, to assess the extent to which government laws were consistent with our fundamental freedoms. So that's really where I am today. I'm talking about a Charter of Rights and how it might uh, provide the legal benchmarks for a, a freer society. But to go back to, my, to where we started, and I know it's a theme for today, um, how do we deal with this phenomenon of distortion of the facts to the extent that people are prepared to accept uh, that facts don't matter anymore, what matters is your subjective and emotional view? Well, I think the only thing to do is to push back against mythologies uh, to, when you hear an argument, go and check the facts, go and see how it stacks up um, have a look at the ABC fact checks or any fact checks that offer. Um, but try to uh, counter your own perhaps emotional response to a situation by seeing what the, what the evidence and policy is. So I really do congratulate you all on this conference. It's terrific to be here to talk to you about things that really matter to me, particularly after the last few years. And I hope through a school of this character and kind, uh, you can assist in pushing back against, against post-truth. Thank you very much.